The Atlanta Falcons 2024 NFL Draft class is in the books, which means it is time for the dumbest thing we possibly do here in sports, which is post-draft grades. Despite these guys not playing a single snap yet for their team, we're still going to give out school letter grades. So make sure to subscribe to the channel, though. We're trying to get to 22,000 subs here. We've got a little bit of ways to go, but this is definitely going to be one of our most viewed videos on the channel for the entire offseason. So if you're not subscribed yet, please consider going ahead and doing so. Now I'm going to run through all eight selections the Falcons made in chronological order, beginning with pick number eight overall, Washington quarterback Michael Penix. Now, this pick has had the fan base, I wouldn't even say split, it's like 90-10, it's that unpopular with Falcons fans. From a football standpoint, I like Penix a lot. He was my fourth quarterback on my big board. He's got an elite arm, he has tons of confidence in his abilities to throw the ball down the field, he is not afraid to push the envelope, he had two great stellar seasons at Washington after four injury-riddled seasons at Indiana. Last year for the Huskies, throwing for nearly 5,000 yards, taking a program that I mean, no one really looked at as a national contender and brought him all the way to the national championship game. Michael Penix is a really good quarterback. I do like Penix as a quarterback, but I don't like this pick for the Atlanta Falcons, and it's not because of Penix's makeup. I don't think the timing is right whatsoever. So I'm going to try and keep this as concise as possible because I think everyone's getting a little bit fatigued about the Michael Penix pick. But I'm giving it a D-. And the only reason I'm not giving it an F is because I like Penix that much as a passer, but I don't like him for the Atlanta Falcons. And honestly, if you had to look at all 32 teams, I bet Penix would have picked the Falcons as one of the least likely teams to take him based on an opportunity to go ahead and start, which is a little bit ironic because that is how Kirk Cousins got in the NFL, going to the Washington Redskins, who took RG3. But here are the main reasons why I don't like the Penix selection for the Falcons and also for Penix. One, the Atlanta Falcons, in their introductory press conference for the selection, cited the Green Bay Packers pick of Jordan Love. That is flawed for a lot of reasons. One... The Atlanta Falcons just spent $180 million on Kirk Cousins. If they liked Penix so much, why spend $180 million on, Pen on a quarterback when you can spend it on Daniil Hunter, Christian Wilkins, and then go get Penix top 10 in the draft? To me, it's a misallocation of funds, and it doesn't really signal that you feel like your team is ready to win right now. If they were ready to win right now, you'd spend a top 10 draft pick at a position of need to complete your roster, not start picking for the 2026 Falcons, which by the way, people are going to be quick to compare Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs, Jordan Love and the Packers. One, if the bar is, well, look how well it worked out for the Chiefs, then you're saying Michael Penix has to be as good as Patrick Mahomes for that pick to make some sense in a few years. Also, the Chiefs didn't just spend $180 million on Alex Smith. So again, a bad comparison. Another reason why I don't like this pick for the Falcons and Michael Penix. Michael Penix is pushing 24 years old. I mean, Terry Fontenot lied to our faces when he said we could see him starting in four to five years. He's saying that because Kirk Cousins is on a four-year contract and he doesn't already want to completely fracture the relationship that is already deteriorating after six weeks ago from signing him, basically saying we're going to pretend like Cousins could be here for his full contract, when clearly Atlanta is already thinking about the post-Kirk Cousins era, which hasn't even started and has three years of guaranteed money, which means if Kirk Cousins is here for at least three of those four seasons, Michael Penix will be closing in on the age of 30 before he gets his first regular season start, unless there's an injury. And for those of you saying, well, Kirk Cousins is coming off an injury, this is a really good backup. You do not spend top 10 picks on backup quarterbacks. If that was the case, every team would take a quarterback in the top 10 because of how valuable backups are, but they don't. This pick does not make sense for Penix. He is not young and 21 years old like Jordan Love was when he came out of Utah State. 
He is going to turn 24 years old next week. He does not need to sit and learn like Love did. He's played six seasons of college football. He's ready to go start right now, not start collecting dust like he will in Atlanta. It doesn't make sense for Penix, but of course he has no say in the matter, and it definitely doesn't make sense for the Falcons. They should invest in their team right now because when you spend $180 million on a quarterback, not only should you believe that you're not going to go QB early in the draft, but you are telling the league, you're telling your owner, you're telling the fan base, we feel like this is a win-now team. Otherwise, we wouldn't spend $180 million on a QB. We'd continue rebuilding. But instead, you don't really believe you're ready to win right now because you didn't use that pick to help you win right now. So do you agree with picking Michael Penix? Yes or no? Let me know in the comment section whether or not you think that was the right selection for the Atlanta Falcons. I genuinely feel bad for Penix. I mean, he got a big payday for going number eight, but he's going to a fan base that's not going to buy his jersey. They're just bought, they just bought Kirk Cousins' jersey. All right, next pick they made at 35 in a trade-up. They went with Clemson defensive tackle Rook Ororo. I know that sounds like I'm doing a bad Scooby-Doo impersonation, but his example for pronouncing his name was, it's like, row, row, row your boat, but no boat part, just Rook at the beginning. So let's get to know Rook Ororo, the Clemson DT, who I think has some similar traits to Grady Jarrett in terms of a pass-rushing upside defensive tackle. Six foot four, coming in between 294 and 300 pounds, probably depends on what day you caught him on and whether or not he just had a meal. Now, last year for the Tigers, he had 25 tackles, five sacks, one pass breakup, 26 pressures. The Falcons clearly fell in love with his pass rushing upside, and they had to go get a pass rusher. And I'm not too disappointed or mad about this selection compared to getting a true edge rusher like Chris Braswell or Marshawn Nealon, because one of the worst places for a quarterback to take pressure is up the middle. And that's what Atlanta is targeting in Rook Ororo. You also have David Onyemata, Grady Jarrett on the wrong side of 30, and Ororo coming, uh, I beg your pardon, Jarrett coming off a torn ACL. I'm going to give this grade a C. Plus. I would have preferred Jerzon Johnny Newton out of Illinois. I feel like he's a better pass rusher than Rook Ororo is, but he's got better physical traits most likely. Really fast 40-yard dash for being a guy barely below 300 pounds. So I think this is an athletic traits pick more than a production pick. And when it comes to pass rushers, I prefer production over traits coming out of college. Next guy up in round number three, where the Falcons originally had two third rounders, but they traded one to get Rook. I've got Braylon, or the Falcons got Braylon Trice at pick 74, the Washington Husky, who, unlike Rook, who dominates with his speed, Trice, he makes his money with his strength. He doesn't have the greatest first step. He's not going to wow you with his bend or with his get off at the snap. But what he is going to do is drive teams' tackles back into the quarterback. He's got phenomenal strength, 245 pounds. Washington listed him, by the way, if I remember correctly, at 275. That's a war crime to be 30 pounds off of what he weighed in at the combine. Now, Trice didn't have the best showing at the Indianapolis combine, and that's not going to upset me too much. I don't think it's fair to make your decisions on prospects based on what they do in underwear in February after watching them play football for four months. That's where I think your opinion should be primarily formed. Now, last year for the Huskies, 49 tackles, seven sacks, two pass breakups, and one forced fumble. So for me, when it comes to grading Braylon Trice, I do like that Atlanta finally went pass rusher at that spot. I'll give it a C grade. C is average, and I think this is just a bigger reflection of the pass, rushing, pass rushers in this draft class saw a severe drop-off after the round one guys of Dallas Turner and Leatu Latu and um, along with Jared Verse. At this spot, I probably would have preferred Jonah Ellis out of Utah. He went a few selections later to the Denver Broncos, but we can make do with Trice because at least Atlanta did something about pass rush in the first two days of the NFL draft. Then to kick off day number four, they went with yet another defensive lineman, 
Oregon's Brandon Dorlis. Dorlis. So let's get to know the Oregon Duck who spent three seasons starting in Eugene. He hopped around the defensive line a little bit, but that's a very college thing to do. You're just going to go wherever your coach needs you. In the NFL, I think the six foot three, 285-pound pass rusher is going to be like a Zach Harrison, five-technique defensive end in a 3-4 defensive front. Like I said, he was a three-year starter for the Ducks. There was a lot of consistency from year to year. A lot of times when you see multi-year starters in college football, if they slip in the draft, it's usually because they were great the season before the previous year where they entered the NFL draft. But in Dorlus's uh, case here, he was pretty consistent all three seasons as a starter. Now, you can look at the scouting report that our NFL draft expert Tom Downey has where he put him down as his number five DT. So pretty good value, all things considered, to find him in round number four. He necessarily wasn't my dream DT, but I'll give it a C-plus grade. C's average, I think it's very, very tough to find A or B grades when you get past the first and second round of the draft. I know when it comes to draft grades, everyone just wants to see a homer pick and give all their team players an A and listen. If that's what you're looking for, you're probably not in the right spot because I'm just going to be honest with everyone when I go through my player grades. But for round number four, to find a quality rotational defensive end, defensive tackle, I think it's a C-plus grade. Now, what's your confidence level in the Falcons' pass rush? Scale it 1 to 10. 10 being you're Terry Fontenot and you think it's going to be top five in the NFL. 1 being you're Matthew Peterson and you don't think it's going to be better than 32nd in the NFL. I'm leaning towards 32nd, then one. Now, next up here in round number five, they go with a hometown kid-ish from Alpharetta, but played his college football up at South Bend for the Fighting Irish. It is JT Bertrand, Bertrand, uh, Bertrand, excuse me. So he's from Alpharetta, like I mentioned. He was Tom Downey's number 12 linebacker overall. I was higher on him than Tom was, though. I just feel like if you lead a team in tackles for three straight seasons, at a power five school, I'll be a sucker for the production over the lack of physical traits. Bertrand doesn't have incredible physical traits to his game. He's not going to have incredible size or speed, and that's a big reason why he fell to day three of the NFL draft. But last year, put up 76 tackles, seven and a half tackles for loss. He was a two-year captain for the Fighting Irish. That's a very prestigious honor. They just don't throw captains around willy-nilly. So you know that in day three, you're getting an ex uh, uh, excellent character and makeup type of person. If he can find a role on special teams, I think him, uh, Nate Landman, and then Troy Anderson can form a really good trio of inside linebackers. And maybe they kick Caden Ellis to outside linebacker to make up for the lack of pass rushers because they didn't address it in free agency and not until the third round of the NFL draft. I'll give this selection a B grade. I thought he would go much earlier than pick 143. Again, I fell in love with the production over a three-year span, the leadership qualities, and a little bit of a homecoming pick as well. So who doesn't love that? Moving on here after going with JT Bertrand at pick number 143, the Falcons had three selections to make in round number six, where I'll kind of go speed mode here. First, it was running back Jace McClellan out of Alabama. I'm going to give this one a C-. minus. I think it's way too mean to be critical of day three picks. If you give it an F, I don't know who you're impressing with that. It's the sixth and seventh round of the NFL draft. But I just don't really see the logic behind taking Jace McClellan. I don't dislike a running back pick, but take a running back that doesn't have something that your current running back room has. Like Jace McClellan, not a very good receiver. Not very good at pass protection. One-year starter that was underwhelming at Alabama. I'm not over the moon about this pick. Next up, it is Wash. Uh, I beg your pardon, Illinois' wide receiver Casey Washington. I'll give it a C grade. I'm not gonna get too passionate about pick 187 of the draft being a boomer bust pick here. I liked the other Illinois wide receiver a little bit more, so I wonder if there was a. Uh, an issue when they submitted the pick, but nevertheless, Washington's got some good speed, five-year guy at Urbana-Champaign, productive season-ish that's been generous last year. The Falcons need a wide receiver. I wish they addressed it earlier, 
this was not my preferred choice. I would have liked Taj Washington out of USC more, but maybe they went the wrong Washington, actually. I, I think there could have been some uh, mistakes here. And then the ultimate pander pick, the Atlanta Falcons with their final selection knew, hey, uh, they're pretty mad outside. It's kind of looking like draft day outside of our offices here at Flowery Branch with the fake picket fences. So let's go with the Georgia Bulldog, Zion Logue. Um, I don't mind getting extra depth on the defensive line. I think they satisfied that with not one, but two defensive tackle picks in Dorlus and Rook Aroraro. So Zion Logue, a Georgia Bulldog, that way people have recency bias going, well, at least they finally took a kid from Athens. Overall, my complete grade for the Atlanta Falcons 2024 NFL Draft is a D. There has to be a weighted scale from your first pick to your last pick. And like I mentioned earlier, and I won't be a broken record, I do not see the logic in picking Michael Penix. I like the player. I like the passer. But I think even Penix would agree, of all 32 teams, this would probably be towards the bottom of his list of places he'd want to go because he's turning 24 years old next week. He's going to sit on the bench for two years. He's going to be towards the end of his rookie contract when he finally gets an opportunity to play. And if you're going to spend $180 million on a quarterback, why don't you reinvest in that uh, pick right there or reinvest in that investment by going with a big need at pick number eight? Instead, you're basically signaling, we're ready to move on from Kirk Cousins before this era even begins. And if you like Penix so much, just draft him at eight and then use that $180 million on other needs in free agency. I would have had no problem with the Falcons if that was their plan all along. But to me, you just double invested into the same position group when it doesn't make any sense. Well, that is it for the 2024 NFL Draft. If you hung out with us during our live coverage, checked out all of our videos pick by pick, I really, really appreciate it. I know that there are thousands of you watching, but honestly, when I go to bed at night, it's truly surreal to see how much this channel has grown. So if you haven't subscribed yet, please go ahead and do so.